Hey y'all, welcome to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Donica, and in today's video, I will be doing a non-spoiler and spoiler book talk on Black Mouth by Ronald Malfi. This is the first book that I've read by him, although come with me, I have seen all over the place, and after reading this one, that is quickly going to bump up my TBR. Maybe I'll add it to my October TBR. I just cannot stop thinking about my October TBR because that has to be the most epic. It's the spookiest month of the year. It has to be the most epic month of the year. <laughs> so come with me might make the October cut. We'll see. If you are new to my book talks, I do non-spoiler in the beginning and that includes a small summary as well as just a few thoughts and opinions I have and why I rated it the way I did. And then we get into the spoiler section where I just look at my notes and kind of talk about whatever pops out from my notes that I took while reading it. But now that that is all out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into my rating for Black Mouth. I did rate this three and a half stars. I was pleasantly surprised by many aspects of this book. The reason it didn't get a higher rating is because I feel like it could have just given me more in terms of almost everything, plot, characters, but we'll go ahead and get into that after I do a brief summary. As soon as you open the book, you are hit with the opening quote. Oh, sometimes opening quotes are so iconic and they really can set the tone for the book. And this one was actually from Alcoholics Anonymous and it said, there is no magic in recovery. I do go into my books not knowing too much. So to see that, I was really intrigued. And we jump into the story right away with our main character, Jamie, who is an alcoholic. He has a mishap at work and he's basically given the choice, lose your job, or go to rehab. So Jamie obviously chooses rehab. In the beginning, not too much of the beginning, but in like maybe 40 to 50 pages, there is almost this dark humor to the writing, kind of of Jamie making light of his situation. Jamie's part is told in first person. He's talking about, you know, the rehab center and he was expecting one thing and he gets another thing. And so I just fell in love with the writing. I mean, Ronald Malfi's writing and me are like best friends. It is beautiful to me and it's descriptive and it's in a way that doesn't become too much for me like maybe too many metaphors or maybe the storytelling drags on too much or things like that it just feels like just right like this Goldilocks writing style for me but like I said he goes into rehab and he makes it through what are they called the something shakes no the the boogie down, oh, the detox boogie. <laughs> Jamie does do the detox boogie. Once again, a little bit of humor with a really, really rough and dangerous situation. He gets through rehab, gets through the boogie, and is two or three months clean when he gets a call that his mother has taken her life. And he does have one younger brother, two years younger than him, named Dennis. But Dennis is disabled and was being taken care of by his mother. So now that Jamie is his only next of kin, it's now on his shoulders to go back to his hometown and figure out what to do with the house and his brother. And so obviously Jamie being sober for such a short amount of time, this big life change is obviously a huge trigger for him. And this is something that he is now fighting for the entire rest of the book. Now the humor that was in the beginning of the book is quickly lost. And you can understand because we are getting it from Jamie's perspective. He's describing it to us. The humor that he may have had when he was sober and clear-minded is now going to obviously be less and less apparent. And although we get that a little bit more throughout, I feel like in the beginning I was getting a lot more of that. So I was sad to see some of that go, but I still absolutely loved the writing. So Jamie has spent decades avoiding his hometown, which is Sutton's Key, West Virginia. And that is because in the summer of his 11th year, him and his two friends met a man that they dubbed the magician. And this man ended up changing the course of their lives forever. As ominous as that sounds, you are getting bits and pieces of that summer throughout the entire book. I had said I thought this would be like a coming of age novel and how, how much I love and feel like that is like the perfect way to wrap up my summer. I definitely did not get a coming of age because really we don't get too much 
of the past of flashing back to Jamie and his two friends so there's really not a coming of age because it's just a brief part of Jamie's summer when he was 11 years old so I was a little sad about that but I didn't know what this story was going to be about so if I had just come into this thinking it's going to 100% be a coming of age story probably would have been disappointed but I came in here just hoping and wasn't that but that's okay still enjoyable although I will say I really enjoyed when Jamie and his friends were younger I love that vibe I love young teenagers getting into mischief whether that's paranormal or just life so I wanted more of that for sure but Jamie's childhood friends really bonded because they lived around something they called black mouth and it was essentially a mine that had collapsed with a bunch of miners inside and it formed almost like a crater and so years have gone by decades have gone by and trees started growing back out of the crater and they looked like teeth so hence the black mouth the locals kind of had like their own urban legends that black mouth was cursed anyone that was born or lived near black mouth would be cursed as well so the black mouth kids they were right on the outskirts of town but if they lived on the edge of black mouth they were kind of the loners and they had to band together so it was jamie his friend clay and their friend mia clay and mia were awesome clay had vitiligo and that is the skin condition where your melanin will start or your skin stops producing melanin or it takes it away i have a great aunt that has that i can only imagine how some kids might get picked on but i'm just one who i think everyone's differences are absolutely stunning and beautiful my son gets a little patch on his cheek that for some reason when he gets dark it like stands out it's like just this little patch and it's i just absolutely love it you can imagine how kids will just rip into each other if there's if you're just even a little bit different so he's picked on and mia is very poor her parents were both killed in a car crash and she was being raised by her uncle so she's very poor and would wear like wife beaters to school she has always had this morbid fascination with death they're all just different so they definitely bond over that and they're like the best of friends these three characters i feel like have the chance to be really unique and and they are and they're very likable as well aside from jamie who is really struggling and you know you can't blame him but mia and clay are very <laughs> likable all three of them all growing up with their own trauma and then facing the shared trauma when they were 11 when they're older and you you're meeting them in the present day me and clay are dealing with their trauma in one way and jamie is dealing with his in another because they've kind of turned their trauma into something that they can manage and something that they can almost either help people in some way or using it to create something like as an outlet and then jamie's outlet is alcohol as the reader obviously for a lot of the book we are faced with him drinking too much blacking out being sick so it's tough to read and not that enjoyable to read but also if you go into this book knowing this is more the horror of addiction and trauma how those two go hand in hand trying to see our characters get to the other side of that however that may be you know that's what this is about if that doesn't sound like it would be enjoyable to you it probably would not be because it's also a very slow burn book kind of you're creeping along getting the story slowly creeping along the plot even at the end the final scenes are wrapped up pretty quickly you know i feel like there's not this like epic conclusion the ending is not like something like you're getting like a crescendo to something bigger i really did not want to compare this to stephen king before i even got into this book i was comparing it to stephen king i see him compared to stephen king a lot and it's hard not to i mean he is a great storyteller stephen king though is just such an icon to me the majority of stephen king i read was when i was way too young to read him i mean truly almost all the Stephen King books I've ever read were when I was a teenager. And then the last book I read by him ever is 
Under the Dome. So that was either in 2010 or 2011, which was a mammoth book that was over a thousand pages. I felt like when I was reading him, I would become so sad, especially in that book. It's a town that is trapped under a dome and everyone starts going wild. It was just such a downer because in his books, I feel like the evil wins for so long that it would just bring me down. So I think I took a step away from reading him. My favorite book by him, I would have to say is Needful Things, although there's so many, but something about Needful Things, it just gets me. Like I said, I read that when I was way too young to be reading that kind of stuff, but gosh, it was so good. And I need to read that again. I really need to read it now being an adult, like what did little Donica have to have to face in that book? So it's like, I can't even compare Ronald Malfi to him. It's just not fair. It's just not fair coming from me, how much I love Stephen King and, and, and like the pedestal I hold him on as a storyteller. The showdown in this book at the end or the conclusion just did not give me enough. Faced with what we're dealing with, especially Jamie and just dealing with his alcoholism and trying to fight the urge to drink, I just feel like I wanted a little more at the end, a reward for all I've had to endure. <laughs> if you were to take out just a small part of the book, because a lot of the book you are kind of having to maybe interpret on your own is what Jamie is experiencing trauma induced, alcohol induced, or something more, something paranormal, something other than this world. But if you take out just a few situations, I feel like what this story is at the core is just a recovering alcoholic that is meeting up with old friends. They're trying to resolve something from their past. They're trying to fix a past transgression. And I feel like that's a good summarization of this book just go into it knowing that it is more slow pace and any sort of conclusion at the end I, to me I felt was a little rushed or just wasn't too thrilled with how some of the things wrap up whether that's because I wanted more or just wasn't happy with the choice I feel like the writing saved the book that's what you know gave it a solid 3.5 and that's what makes me want to read more from him because if I really like how some like an author writes then surely there is a book, there is a plot, there is a story that they have to tell me that I'm gonna love. Three and a half stars is still a solid read, it's still a solid suggestion to you. This won't be a book that I'm like 100% everyone needs to pick up. It's kind of one of those books where I'm just like tread carefully with your expectations, know what you're getting into, and I think you'll be in for a real treat. I want to read one little part because there's just so many pretty sentences he has throughout like I said, that weren't too much. It was just enough, just enough to really have me thinking and just pausing and being like, wow, he worded that really good. In the summer of my 11th year, a monster came to Blackmouth. It came in the night, slinking below the sight line of normal folks. Perhaps it sought me out the way a bloodhound tracks a scent, or perhaps it was sheer happenstance, a flip of a coin, a flutter of distant butterfly wings. Events in our lives often have meaning because we choose to give them meaning. Whatever the case, it arrived in the way monsters sometimes do, as a creature in need. I mean, is that not gripping? We're 45 pages in and this whole time, I've just been completely enthralled with the way he's telling me this story. And while I do feel like it fell a little flat to me, it didn't mean I didn't enjoy the ride getting to where we got to. It's so funny I picked that one because this book is really a lot about fate. Even with why the magician happened to come upon these three kids, these three kids kind of living on the outskirts and with the parents they had or the situations they were in, were they fated to grow up and be lost to drugs and addiction or lost to, you know, kind of having to settle with whatever life can give them? Because it's very interesting as you're reading how these three face their trauma and what they could have been and then what they became. That will be all for the non-spoiler. If you have any questions or comments, if I didn't get to something or didn't answer a question you have, feel free to leave it down below. I am Speedy Gonzalez. I try to get back to y'all as fast as I can. But thank y'all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to find your way back. Now it's time to jump into the spoiler section of the video. So I have about 30 minutes to talk because my son, I need to take him to the doctor. So we're just gonna chit chat for the next 30 minutes. 
So with the opening quote being no magic in recovery, let's like just start right from the beginning. I've never heard of that quote, so I didn't know how it ended. I just thought that was the ending. But we learned that it's there's no magic in recovery, only miracles, which is so interesting. And I have been always like hyper aware of becoming addicted to something always since I was younger. I don't know why, but the fear of addiction has always really scared me. I don't smoke. I hardly drink. And if there's like a period, especially during COVID, when we were all locked down, I feel like a lot of us kind of drank a little bit more y'all it was stressful that's fine but i was drinking this one like cocktail i was making it was so good every night and i just got this intense fear of just having a casual drink like i'm just hyper aware of am i becoming addicted when i went through uh, things with my mental health i was even hyper aware of becoming addicted to medicine that was helping me feel better helping me recover just this thing i have where i'm just scared of becoming addicted so I did not know at all, and it's not a trigger for me or anything like that, but I was just unaware that this book was gonna be so much about addiction. I feel like Ronald Amalfi really did a good job of putting us in the mind of Jamie and what he was going through and how he was suffering, and gosh, there were so many moments, so maybe I'll get to some. You really felt for him because there's even on this page I already have open, he's talking about a bottle of vodka. It's telling him, I'm as big as you are bigger even like I'm bigger than you I'm bigger than your will to not drink me I am bigger and stronger than your ability to say no to me and that is that shit is powerful like that really is powerful because there are so many people out there that succumb to the bottle and succumb to that desire there are moments where he straight up is just like I'm drinking because I cannot handle this I'm drinking to be strong even though I'm weak and it's just so sad and so powerful to read from this perspective especially in a horror novel where I'm thinking I'm gonna get one thing I had thought it was vampires in the beginning I was like thinking we were gonna get vampires I could not have been more wrong just to realize it's more about like trauma and how that can really change your life. Mia was a girl after my own heart. When her parents died in a car crash and she went to live with her uncle, she became hyper-focused on looking up autopsies and anything dead. With Mia, like, focusing on these things, I totally relate to her. And she was such an awesome character. Clay was such an awesome character. We saw quite a bit of them, but I just wanted more. I just wanted more of them. In the final battle, I'm skipping ahead, but I was so sad that Mia and Play were not with Dennis and Jamie. I was kind of upset and I understand the character Wayne, I understand his purpose, but I almost feel like we should have just taken him out and really focused on the magician, somehow figured out a way. And that's a whole discussion too because so much of this book felt like there was no magic, like magic wasn't real. Everything was just false memories or the magician maybe tricking them trick of the light things like that when like the magician literally levitates in front of them like wait what the magician did did he have powers did he not it's kind of unclear until we get to the end where they're in a whole nother dimension like i said i'm jumping ahead weird but for literally 90 percent of the book you could argue that there was nothing paranormal going on even when Jamie sees like a ghost in the motel window maybe it is a hallucination maybe he is it's his mind playing tricks on him the guilt seeping through just for like the whole book to for me to be like is there something magical happening or something paranormal is there not and then for us to get to the end and they're in a whole new dimension I was just like I, I don't know how I feel about that <laughs> but uh Loved Mia, loved Clay, great characters. I really wanted to see more of them when they were little. Fate obviously plays a huge role in this book. You have Jamie comes home because his mother passes. Mia is looking for him on that same weekend he's home because when she was in Kentucky, which was a random question A event she was doing there, she sees someone that looks like the magician exactly from afar and she takes a picture. So fate calling them back together, fate with Clay working in social work, dealing with kids. So being able to possibly help Molly, yeah, Molly, how their lives 
intertwined again now in present day. Part one was just all Jamie heading back to Blackmouth and sensing like impending doom. You're getting a little bit of the magician, kind of like a sneak peek of what's to come, even though in part two is when like the apprenticeship really starts. When Jamie comes home one day after being with the magician, he comes home and his dad is just beating on his mom. Like his dad really, really, really beats on the mom and Dennis and Jamie. It's really sad. So much so that Dennis, who is nine, he starts disassociating until he'll go into his turtle shell because they had a pet turtle. So Dennis thought it was so funny that the turtle would go into his little shell when he was scared. So Dennis started going into his turtle shell is what he called it. That translates to when he's older, he loves the Ninja Turtles. And there was that one moment when they were at the carnival Okay, see, I wouldn't even be emotional right now, but Ronald Malfi really crossed the line when he killed Dennis. What was the point? What was the reason? <sighs> but <laughs> this sweet moment when they're at the carnival and Dennis is gonna hit that mallet on that thing to try and make it ring the bell. And Dennis is a mat, he's a giant, he's massive. So he puts his little bandana on that he's cut holes out of, like his little Ninja Turtle mask. And he's like, go Ninja, go. Or he says something like that and then he hits it and it's just, this beautiful moment. And in that moment, I was just so heartbroken because I was thinking, look at all the fun he's had with Jamie just these last couple of days with Jamie being back. Despite all of the circumstances, he's still with his brother. He's still going to the carnival and eating pizza. And you know, he hasn't seen his brother regularly in years. So I was just thinking, oh my gosh, what kind of life did he live with his mother for all those years you know the house was run down didn't have electricity everything was dirty and for him just to have these sweet moments with his brother it's just so much more special knowing that Ronald Malfi killed him off in the end of the book <laughs> so I kind of just wrote down that all of them are dealing with the trauma of whatever happened that summer because I didn't know yet at this point Mia turned it into art with those controversial movies she makes Clay uses his trauma to heal and help kids that are dealing with their own trauma and I put Jamie is not coping at all. <laughs> he has not coped with his trauma yet. He cannot turn it into something beautiful or helpful yet because he's really not dealt with it and he's masking it as best as he can with the alcohol, which is crazy to think about because he's in his mid thirties. So this is going on 20 years of just having to try to just push it down, push it down. Part two, the kids start the apprenticeship. Jamie brings Dennis to the magician and the magician, this part is one of the things I'm not quite sure about. So if you have any ideas why the magician was uneasy when Dennis came around and seemed to almost weaken or he started not being able to do magic very well. He died after the kids met him. We learned he did die after they met him. When they're talking to Patch, who is the new magician, he's talking to them about when he died. And when they looked it up, they were like, whoosh, he died after we met him. That makes him relieved because if he had died before, then they would have been seeing a ghost. So once again, they were like, okay, this can be explained. Another thing in the book that can be explained. So he made the deal with the devil when he lost his eye and the devil said, I'm assuming it's a devil. That's also to be debated, but he made a deal with something and he had to take lives of children to stay healthy or fit or active, I'm not sure. So when Dennis came around, he was almost weakened for some reason. Did Dennis have like some sixth sense? I mean, clearly he had something. What was it about Dennis? What, did the magician sense or feel that in the future Dennis would be his demise? I am not sure why he almost seemed weakened by Dennis. So if you have any ideas of why, let me know. When the magician made them do the test with the fire, and by this time Dennis is coming regularly with them to the woods, the magician had said, hey, you're gonna have to do something. I'm gonna test you. I'll be testing you. You have to trust me. He started a fire one night and said, put your hand in the fire and don't take it out until I tell you. So Jamie fails, Clay fails, Mia is holding it there, but then Jamie, I think, freaks out and is like, take it out. So Dennis all of a sudden just puts his hand there and just holds it. So the magician says, well, Dennis is the one, he's passed the test, he's the one that will be able to make it to the well. Dennis, whether he had some sort of sixth sense before or not, he definitely does after this weird night 
because he now has some sort of connection and can see kind of almost like a clairvoyance to him or some sort of ability. It's almost like Dennis is connected to either the magician or anything that has to do with the magician. Out of everything in this book, at least we know one thing, Dennis has some sort of supernatural ability. And I do believe the alternate dimension of Blackmouth at the end was also with the weird guard hippo. I believe that happened. So there were some sort of elements this book that were unexplainable or, you know, something supernatural. I'm gonna take a brief break. For me, it'll be a couple hours. For you, it'll be one second. So I might be a little out of position. We'll get back to talking about old Wayne here in a bit. Okay, I am back only mildly frazzled. My oldest son had to get a sports physical, cleared it. Now he's going to be doing cross country this year. I am not a runner, so cross country? <laughs> No, not for me. Back to what I was saying. We were introduced to Wayne in chapter 12. So this was about halfway through the book. Things are kind of creepy, but I feel like they were leaning more onto just explainable things brought on by trauma and grief and false memories. When I was reading this, you know, that's kind of how I was approaching Jamie's memories sometimes, like with the magician, when he would levitate, I was thinking maybe that is just a memory, even a shared memory that they're just remembering a certain way, like, oh my gosh, you remember he levitated, but really it was just a trick of the light. So everything was pretty chill, okay, up until this point. And then mouth shaped mouth happened. And this was, this was epic. While I can't argue that you could take Wayne's part out and really dive into the magician and really dive into more supernatural or paranormal or whatever with the magician. Wayne's part was one of the best parts of the book for sure. First of all, I was very confused who he was because when they were talking about him in his chapter, it kind of alludes to something being wrong with his face. I was thinking, is he a burn victim? Did that little baby that died in the fire? I don't even know if we for sure know they died at this point. I can't quite remember. But I was thinking, is that the is he the little baby that was in the fire? Did he somehow live? And he's seeking revenge against Jamie and he's like a burn victim. But we find out his backstory is so much more horrifying than just simply burns. This dark element to Wayne just came out of the blue for me because I'm truly just chilling reading this book. Not too much is going on. And then we get to Wayne being fired, him being super, super offended and feeling like, oh, you're firing me because of how I look. And he also has a speech impediment too. So you can say whatever you want about you have to let people go, but I know, I know the real T sis and it's because of how I look. We find out later, it's definitely, I'm sure he's giving off a whole vibe since he is a serial killer. That chapter is only a few pages long, chapter 12. And it ends with Wayne going to his boss's house or his former boss, cause he was just fired and blinding his dog with bleach. So we have very tame book in my opinion up until this point and it's just out of the blue, the most horrific scene. It, I was, I was shook it. I will tell y'all if y'all read that, were y'all shook it? Because it just, I didn't know what to expect from Ron Amalfi and up until this point, it's just pretty writing. And then this, holy guacamole, truly, what's going on? So that shook up the whole book. Wayne continued to shake up the book because he is now without a job. He sees on the TV the picture Mia took of that man in Kentucky. He's just laughing when he sees that. Later on, we find out that was him. He would put different faces on and he had one that resembled the magician. So he goes on the hunt looking for Mia, Clay, all of these people. He wants to kill them to take their apprentice energy, <laughs> essentially. I believe it's because he still believes if he kills enough of these apprentices, he will be able to heal himself physically, maybe actually obtain magic to heal his appearance. Obviously he's very mentally disturbed though, so he might just also get sick satisfaction out of killing people. I mean, well, yes, because when he's starting to take his road trip, he makes a side stop to kill a woman, 
brutally sprinkled throughout the book are things that you can't quite explain. Maybe you could say this was like trauma manifesting as a physical pain. Still kind of, I just don't think that explains it. When they get back to Sutton's key and they're starting to piece together, the magician is traveling or has traveled with the carnival in the past and that's how he would find these little towns with these kids that were loners seeking out something, anything to just help them, something to make them special. They start exhibiting symptoms from when they were kids. Jamie, it was his arm because his dad pushed him down the stairs and it was broken. Clay, it was his black eye because when he was at the carnival, he had got punched. And then Mia, no, Mia's, I'm sorry, was later on, she had tried to take her own life and her wound of that scar started bleeding. So that was at a separate time. But they had like these wounds from the past that were related to the magician re-emerging. There was definitely things afoot that could not just be explained. Like this book did have supernatural elements, but for so much of it, I was thinking, you know what, I might get the whole book and this could all just be explained by trauma. And that would actually be really neat. Before I got to the end, I was thinking, would I be disappointed? It could all just be explained by mundane things that like exist in this world. Things that can be explained with science. <laughs> I was okay with it. I was like, you know what? Yeah, I think that would be an interesting twist that it's all just comes down to trauma. How many times have I said trauma in this video? But that whole, alternate dimension black mouth at the end. I can't explain that. Dennis taking in the magician and dying. I, that's why I'm so confused how I feel about the ending. I'm so torn. Do I hate it or do I like it and accept it? Because I don't love it for sure, especially Dennis dying. His whole life he made it just to die at the end for the greater good, maybe to trap the magician and maybe trap this demon that was in some weird little void. This is an interesting thought. Who's to say that Wayne, who is on the cusp of death, who's to say he won't find the void and make a deal with this weird creature and then come back? I mean, he would be arrested immediately, so there's no point, but <laughs> that would be an interesting kind of thought to have about the cycle will continue. Just continuing on with Wayne, chapter 19, we do get his backstory with Bibby and the magic man, and we see what Wayne had to go through. Wayne was born with a double cleft lip, and although this could be corrected, it could have been corrected when he was younger, his mother told him essentially, when he asked as he got a little bit older, why didn't you fix me? I know you could have. And she said, well, God sent you to me like that and who am I basically to judge what God sends me. Meanwhile, she's castrating her son to prevent him from, oh gosh, all that, oh my gosh. Wayne's backstory is jacked up, nature versus nurture. Was Wayne destined to be a psychopath because of what his mother did to him? Just like the magician tells Jamie at the end, you were destined to be a delinquent. I helped you along the way, but that was your path. Just to kind of wrap up, you know, there's so many beautiful sentences I wrote down. Clay and me are trying to get a breakthrough with Jamie. Clay's like, deal with it, see it through. You can do this. And Jamie's just like, I can't. And Clay's like, that's your excuse, Jamie. You're making excuses for 20 plus years. And Jamie says, it's not, it's the truth. I'm all effed up inside. I grew up to be just like the son of a bitch I swore I never would. Cried about never being like him, but look at me now, Clay, look at me now. All that destiny and fate talk, Mia's been spouting, well, this is my destiny, this is my fate. There's a history in my blood, man. I don't drink because my father was an abusive piece of shit, and I don't drink because we killed a woman and her baby when we were kids. I don't even drink to keep their ghosts away. That's just a bonus, man, I drink because it's my sad effing nature to drink, that I find comfort in a half inch of alcohol sitting there in a bottle, that I bring a drink to my lips and it's like someone wrapping their arms around me, telling me it's all gonna be all right, that I keep being tricked by a bottle of effing poison. That's such a good summary of what I do feel like alcoholics, or at least, you know, Jamie really feel. Thinking I can put life on pause the moment I take a drink. Buying some time to figure my shit out. That's it. That's all it is. I'm my father's son, man. 
Wow. Oh, gosh. So, and that's like so powerful at that point because you're really rooting for him because at this point you're like, come on, get it together. And he does by the end. But at what cost, really? I mean, he's lost so much. I think it does end on a semi-hopeful note. I feel like that really is a good book club pick. I feel like you really have so many topics you can go over. I could really just sit here and discuss forever nature versus nurture, memories that are shaped and shifted by trauma, how trauma can shape you and change your destiny. Is destiny or fate real? Is it all just coincidence? There's so much to talk about and this book has a lot of moments that you can kind of go back and forth with someone. Was this fate? Was this destiny? Was this magic? But that will be all from me for today, guys. Like I always say, if you have any questions or comments or you want to discuss anything about this book, what did you think about this book? Did it give you all you wanted? Were you wanting a little bit more of anything? What do you think about the characters? Who was your favorite? I loved Mia. Obviously Dennis, come on. Go Ninja, go Ninja, go. Go Ninja, go Ninja, go. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe to find your way back. Y'all take care and I will see you in my next video. Bye. I feel like I almost look like I have a little mullet or something. Like I'm giving Billy Ray. Am I giving Billy Ray? Because I hope I am. I really hope, like with this top, I feel like I'm giving Billy Ray. Don't break my heart.